Um, hello, everyone. Just to introduce myself, I'm Sarah Jan and I'm the marketing secretary for Knowledge Train. Knowledge Train and Agile, C, uh, Agile KRC is in partnership, which is the main reason why there's two logos. Um, we here, we have Luce with us today, so thank you so much for joining. Um, right at the end, we will have a Q&A session, so if you do have any questions, please pop them down in the chat and we will go over them right at the end. So Luce, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Sevjen, and thank you, Knowledge Train, for bringing me in to talk about this topic that I love so much, which is thriving in change. And often we think about change as far as change control or change management. Uh, we're not necessarily thinking about it on the change control side. We're very much thinking about it in the change leadership and change management components. So how do we navigate all of the changes that are fa we face on a regular basis in our lives and work? Um, and so I'm just delighted to work with all of you today. I look forward to our active chat and conversation throughout the session. So as an overview, our plan is to talk about two components. One is an introduction to change. What is change? How do we define change? How do folks respond to change? What are some of the components uh, and normal reactions that we see? And thanks for the introductions in the chat. Love, love, love seeing all of that. Hi, Kim. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Um, and then in part two, we'll think about thriving, focus in on thriving. What does thriving mean to you and how do we get to that state where we're actually thriving? And we'll wrap up with any reflections and next steps. So looking forward to the conversation with everyone today. My name is Luz Flores Lee. Luz means light in Spanish. And it sounds like your shoe is loose. And I'm a change leadership coach with Loving All of You. And I tend to work with new leaders as they transition into their role as a leader from an individual contributor. So that's a huge change for most folks and helping them navigate that one. So let's introduce change. So if we think about in the chat, what are some of the kinds of changes you're experiencing now? I did a survey. I've done this presentation many times and one a few times I've done a survey that included the types of changes that folks are going through. So if you think about what are some of the types of changes you're navigating right now? Are there financial challenges, new businesses or a new role in the job, job loss or transition? What are some of the things um, that you're navigating right now? Yes, new system in the business. Oh, that's a big one, right? So transitioning systems, uh, those kinds of enterprise-wide transitions are huge, right? When you're you're doing those those in your office and work, absolutely. I'm working with a team right now that's navigating that, and that's not only a technical change; it's a personal uh, change in everyone's role. Uh, Aluchi's mentioning new role, new job, new projects. Woo, more than one, more than one change, right? So that's also what we see. So I had 36 folks responding to this survey. And you'll notice if you add up the numbers, there are way more than 36 here. And that's another highlight that most people, like Kim mentions in the chat, too many changes at once. Often we're facing more than one major change at the same time. And if you think about it, this is just a sample of 36. Just in the chat, we're seeing at least a couple of folks who have more than one change happening at one time. And so now you realize we're it's unsteady, right? This is a, a transition that we have to go through on top of surviving every day, thriving on what we're working on, right? So it's uh, something that's really easy to take us out of our game. And what we want to be able to do is use these tools to help us get back in. So there are seven dynamics of change that folks go through, and they don't have to go through all of them, but many will go through more than one of these. Look at the list. Are there any on this list that speak to you? Do you, how do you feel about them? Any questions? Feel free to post in the chat. Um, and you've seen this, whether you're leading the change, like an enterprise-wide change, like Natalie was mentioning, or if you're just dealing with the change yourself. Any of these speak to you? I see some folks are typing. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes angry first. We'll get into those emotions for sure, right? Like there's, there's a response, an emotional response we have as human beings to any change. And we'll go, go to that next, Natalie. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So often, yeah, resources. Sometimes folks, like Kim mentioned, sometimes people will worry about having enough resources to handle the change. And that's often a challenge if we don't really think that through. 
uh, we could miss out on being able to enable the change that we need to have happen. Resentments, yes. Yeah, so sometimes folks feel angry and resentful that we have to change the way things were working. You know, what, if there's that saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it kind of thing, right? Um, but sometimes those changes have to happen. And sometimes things are broken that we don't know about. And we need to be able to, to handle those. Um, that kind of feeds to the, if you take the pressure off, people will revert back to old behavior, right? The fact that sometimes we have those, those habits that we want to go back to. And if we don't replace it with a new habit that actually works, it's our tendency to go back. Um, yeah, change, being a change manager, people will push back. Oh, for sure, for sure. And we'll talk about that and we'll talk about managing and thriving uh, complex in complex change. Excellent, excellent. So again, the other big piece about this is you're not alone. Everyone has responses to change. They don't have all have the same responses to change, but we all have a response. If you're going along and things are going well for you, you may um, not always like it, but you have to, to be able to navigate it. And being aware of the fact that everyone is going through some level of change is really important to know. So uh, Natalie mentioned, you know, the, the responses to change. And there's this tool and, and, and model called the Kubler-Ross change curve. For those who are familiar with the grief process, you may recognize components here, and it's based on a similar uh, flow, because one of the things you mentioned in the seven dynamics of change is that folks think about what they're going to lose first, and loss is a huge change, and, and there's grief, and there's, uh, yeah, grief and feelings associated with a loss, right? So often, when we have a change, we don't always know, but we are going through these transitions. I have a local supermarket that, that I go to on a regular basis. And when I go to the market to buy things and they've moved the items around, which they tend to do frequently, I don't know why, and it frustrates me often, right? I go through this cycle. <laughs> I could be shocked. Like, really? Did they move this again? <laughs> I can't believe they've moved it. I get frustrated. I might even like be low energy, like oh, one more thing I have to deal with. But then I can get into experimentation. Where else can I go or decide to ask someone for help? Good grief, if that's even possible, right? Ask someone for help and then being able to integrate that change so I can move on. A tiny little change like the supermarket relocating things to a massive change like the system and enterprise software change, we all go through this process. How is it helpful to know that we have these different emotions? when going through a change? How can we be responsive to the folks that we're working with or even ourselves in knowing this? See some folks are typing. So yeah, everyone goes through them. They may not always go through them in the same order. I know for major changes, I can stay in depression and experiment for a really long time before I move on. I could bounce from shock to decision and then back again. Um, yeah, so it's, it, I would like how we can understand them better and how do you influence it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and organizational change is actually dri absolutely driven by individuals. So actually in in including people in the process is huge. My background is project management. And one of the things that I realized was that if we don't pay attention to the people side of change, if we don't have the skills to manage the change, the communications and the coaching that needs to happen, it doesn't matter how great our solution is. It doesn't matter how technically competent we are. What matters is people's perceptions of it. And we need to be able to navigate that. And there are some tools I'll share about that for sure. And Aluchi mentioned maintaining a calm disposition, right? So being aware of this response, I think Natalie mentioned it earlier, that sometimes folks have this negative response to us when we are change leaders. We have to be able to stand in the storm and know it's not personal. It's not about us. It's about the change. And that folks will have to go through this cycle. Um, the other piece of this is sometimes we start off with shock and denial and we don't have conversations about things and then we move into frustration or depression 
um, experimentation and we actually feel like we can make progress. So even though the feeling is negative, it's actually moving us forward into the ability to decide and integrate this new solution. So allowing for that space for folks to have that transition, time and energy. And often as leaders, we go through our own response, we do our work and we're ready for the change because we've given ourselves time to navigate it. But then by the time we introduce it to our teams and our colleagues, we don't expect them to have the same response. We expect them to be where we are and we can't. They're too early in the process. We need to give them space as well to allow for it to integrate and to have feedback loops and communications to make it happen. So what are some other coping strategies? I think Aluchi, yeah, Aluchi mentioned, you know, maintaining a calm dis disposition and having the ability to think through and be patient, right, with people. What are some of your other coping strategies? I have a, a, a word map here of some of the comments that folks have made in different uh, surveys that I've done, you know, staying positive, using their time to speak with family or friends or colleagues, um, speaking, exercise, right? Are there other tools that you use to cope with changes as they're happening? Yeah, I give people time to, and a plan for that time. Yes, yes. So some exercises or activities to keep it moving forward, yes. Often we've done listening sessions where you just let people vent or one-on-ones for those who are really, really struggling with the change to get into the conversation about what is actually in the way. And a lot of times it's, it's something either we've missed in our transition or a concern that has nothing to do with the transition. You know, one of the comments around the seven dynamics of change, and I think Kim mentioned it too, we can only handle so much change. So some people may respond to a change that we're introducing and it has nothing to do with that. It's just the fact that they've got like five other changes going on in their lives. And this is one more thing they weren't really able to handle. So we do use these strategies to get us through the change and be able to really be mindful and present so that we can actually keep things moving forward. And as leaders, change leaders, leaders of organizations, leaders of projects, we need to have that space to be able to cope with the changes so that we can present the best foot forward and be open to what others need in order to navigate the transition. Yes, positive consultation with people, give them time. Yes, absolutely. So if you think about this model, right, the seven dynamics of change, the um, so the seven dynamics of change, as well as the change, um, the Kubler-Ross change model, are there helpful components so far around change? Are we all on the same page about how much it takes to handle a change? Any thoughts? So yeah, some ideas around like keeping the positive consultation with folks and just having this awareness can help you realize that if they're being negative toward you, it's not about you, right? And that as a leader, because we know this is the process that people have to follow and that they, and we can identify where are they on the curve? What is the next step and how do we get to them to that? How do we coach them? Um, yeah, so how do you get them past first certain points? We'll talk about some of those components um, in order to really think through the next steps. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely a struggle. And thinking about what the next phase is, you can ask questions to guide them to that um, as well. Yes, great, great, great points. So how do we thrive? Um, so, yeah, regular one-on-ones, absolutely. So providing that clarity as much as possible and really having those conversations around what do they need and what are the concerns? And we do have a tool that will help uh, navigate that. So now that we understand change, how do we thrive in it? What does thriving even mean? Um, and one of the quotes that I love is the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. We have to focus our priorities and our, our vision around what is next. What is it that we want to accomplish instead of thinking about what we've lost and what we have to get over? And again, this means you have to allow space for the grieving process for that transition to let go and move on into that integration so that you can move forward. So giving yourselves the space and the tools to do that uh, and allowing for the space for your team to do so. So how does it, what does it mean to thrive? What do you think of when you think of thriving? 
Here are some responses that I've received in conversations and surveys. Are there others? Are there any here that align with what you're thinking? So when you think of excelling, yes, absolutely. Excel is definitely one, right? You want to be able to do better. You want to be able to, to be excellent at the things that you are doing, right? Um, we talk about peace. We talked about being calm and peaceful before having clarity, being able to flourish, recover quickly, um, being able to transition, having some type of a balance. All of these are definitions that folks have used about thriving. And one thing you might notice around Thrive is that, oh uh, yeah, flexibility for sure, right? Thriving are a bunch of skills. These are all skills you can build, you can develop, and you can learn in order to be more in, in that state of thriving. And so that's really key is that thriving isn't about what you have or where you are or your job title. There are lots of folks who have tons of money and are not thriving. They're miserable. Right? So it's not so much only about the resources you have. It's about the mindset you have and the skills that you develop in order to be able to look at things differently and to really consider where you are, and where you'd like to be. And so that transition and that thought of thriving as a skill set now opens the door for us to be able to create more sustainable thriving in our lives and work. How do we do that? How do we focus in on the items that will create a space for us to thrive? Um, if anyone's familiar with Finkley Covey, there are lots of tools around time management and prioritization strategy. And this is one of the concepts of Franklin Covey. Um, they have this idea of the whirlwind. The whirlwind is everything you do in a day, the stuff that happens. It's the phone call you make, the email you respond to, the day-to-day -day activities, eating, sleeping, things you have to do in order to get through a day. Um, and does anyone have an example? Like if you can think of a day where you were so busy, but at the end of the day, you thought, wow, I got nothing done. Does anyone have any of those kinds of days? If you do, and most people do. <laughs> yeah, it happens often, right? A lot of days. And that means you were caught in the whirlwind. Your day was just swooped up into the whirlwind of all the things you just have to do. However, that's not a way to thrive, right? If we're caught in the whirlwind, every night we go and look at our day and say, what the heck did I get done? And I didn't move my goals forward. Then we're caught in the whirlwind. And our goal is to lower that level make space for two things. One is our goals and the other is for the interruptions. Because if our whirlwind is filling our calendar all the way to the brim, if it's all the way at the top, if I have one incident, one major change or what, or sometimes it's just going into the supermarket and they change the location of my milk, <laughs> then I'm over and I'm done. Like I can have a mental breakdown because of the location of something because I am filling myself to the brim. And so our goal is to navigate that whirlwind, drop it down enough so we have space for changes that happen that we can respond to instead of reacting to and focusing in on our goals that will continue to build our skill sets so that we can continue to thrive. So that's where we wanna focus. We wanna make sure we make time for those goals in order to be able to see the gains that we're looking for. So another piece of information that is super helpful in visualizing the idea of these goals is the number of goals matters. If you have two to three goals, your likelihood of success is at least 67%, two out of three. At best, 100%. So, so uh, two thirds to 100% of your goals will get accomplished if you focus in on two to three. You add one more goal and your likelihood of success goes down to 50% at best at best. You've dramatically shifted your ability to be successful because you're spreading yourself too thin. And if you go above 10, you're at zero. 
this is a classic case of if everything is important, nothing's important. And you need to be able to prioritize no more than two to three major initiatives, major goals that need your attention, that need your time and focus in order to be able to achieve them with excellence. And that's also part of thriving, right? I don't know how often you've had a project or an activity where you've completed it, but it wasn't done so well and you don't feel good about it. That's not thriving. <laughs> that's not thriving. That's getting by. So what are those things that matter most to you so that you can really focus in on the ability to make those uh, those shifts and those go meeting those goals so that you can get into a place of really feeling accomplished and thriving? So how do we do that? How do we prioritize those items? And, you know, this quote here, right? There will always be more good ideas than there is a capacity to execute right now. This is not saying you can't do it all. You can totally do it all. You just can't do it all at once. You need to be able to really focus in on those items that will do the most good for your goals and figure out how to pull other things off your plate or get them done in spaces where you don't need as much mental energy and attention. There are several matrices to help you prioritize. Impact effort is one of my favorites when you think strategically. When I'm thinking of it as a leader who's looking at the big picture of items, right? If I'm considering how do I make sure that I move the needle, I move myself closer to the goals, the impact effort matrix is one of my favorites. So with impact effort, the x-axis across this bottom, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor moving, but yes, um, so the increasing impact. So low impact is on the left, high impact is on the right. And then the y-axis is effort. How much effort am I putting into this? Uh, lower effort is at the bottom, higher effort is at the top. So if we think about where do we prioritize our efforts and our activities, Anything on the left side here, so the low impact, high effort, or the low impact, low effort, we don't want to spend most of our time in. Low impact, high effort are things that are like more bureaucratic or lots of paperwork, things that take a lot of time and energy to do, but they don't necessarily help us very much. Low impact, low effort are things that are super easy to achieve and can totally eat up our entire day. <laughs> These are the things like uh, being on social media and all the likes and ha has and all the responses, the low effort, impact, low effort. They don't really move us a lot, but they, they can take up a lot of our time, right? And so we want to be able to think through how we might minimize some of that and achieve as much as we can, but really think about how much of my day do I want on low impact items? Are there low impact items that are, and low effort items I can maybe delegate to someone else on the team? Or there are lots of automation technologies now that are very uh, helpful that you can even implement. So we really want to minimize the left hand. So low impact, high effort, low impact, low effort. And focus more of our attention on the places where we get high impact. I'll start with quick wins, high impact, low effort on the right hand bottom side. Um, and if you're okay with colors, it's the green. We want to spend our time in the green and the blue, this right hand side of, of, the, of the quadrants. So quick wins are great for motivation, for you know feeling like you're accomplished. Uh, an example of a high impact, low effort item could be, uh, we've got an email chain or a chat that's going on and on and folks are confused and they're arguing, let's stop pause, let's have a meeting, quick 15 minutes, let's all talk it out, and then be able to move on and prioritize. Another could be you notice that uh, a friend or a colleague or someone that you care about is going through something or having a, uh, an issue, you make a, 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 a quick call, check in. 10, 15 minutes of touching base, high, uh, high impact because you're really being present and mindful and um, those little things matter. When someone checks in, you see someone in the hallway, if you're still in office, if not, you might want to you know, do something electronically and just have a quick check-in. How's it going? I care about you as a person and I want to see you succeed. Those are huge impacts, but not a lot of effort. They don't take a ton of time, but they make a big impact. And then lastly, 
high impact, high effort. So these are the, the strategic projects. These are the items that don't take a lot of time. Uh, they don't uh, happen quickly and they require a shift. Those high impact, high effort items are things like your New Year's resolutions or the major goals that the company has identified as things that need to get done. And um, if you look at New Year's resolutions, <laughs> Within the first two weeks of January, most have dropped the New Year's resolutions. Most people have dropped them. Why? Well, because they're high impact, absolutely things that we all know we should do, right? Like the, the lofty goals of eating right, exercising, sleeping well, all of it's going to happen all at once. So that's too much. Too much to try and plan. And we don't have a plan on how to actually make it happen. Something that's sustainable. So with our strategic project, we really need to think through how are we going to get that done? How are we going to implement that and integrate that into our normal schedule? Otherwise, it's not going to happen because it takes that, that level of effort. Another note is that the low impact, high effort items that we want to avoid, sometimes we can't. I know that in many industries, we've had compliance projects. They're not an impact as far as like they don't necessarily help. They keep us from having some, you know, liabilities, but they take a lot of effort. Well, we may not be able to avoid them, but maybe we can turn them into a strategic project that could be um, to minimize its impact or to streamline the process so that it doesn't have as much effort associated with it. So as leaders, as, you know, initiating Think about how do you structure your day? Like, how are you spending your time now? And if I were to take your list and put it into the buckets, these four quadrants here, how much of your time are you spending in each of the quadrants? How much of your day is spent on those high impact, high effort strategic projects to move them forward versus the other three? And this could be personal and professional. Yeah, not enough. Okay. Yeah. So that's a big one, right? When you think about this and really wanting to move things forward. Um, yeah, the other swamp, the, the, that whirlwind will take over. They will take over. And so you have to be very protective and creative around your time. And if you have management teams or other supports or key stakeholders, finding ways to adjust your workload so that you have time to work on those. On the personal side, finding ways to look at the way I'm spending my time. So personally, on my personal side, I spend a lot of time on social media. I live away from my family. That's the way I connect with my family. But if I spend all day on social media, yeah, I'm connecting here or there, but am I really doing the things that matter to me and my family? No. So I have to, I, I put in timers on my social media accounts. So they shut down once I hit a certain time limit or removing them from my phone or different things that you can do to make sure that you're spending your time where you know it matters most. And that doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. You just need to have some time. I don't know if anyone has um, read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a phenomenal book about how do you make sustainable change and building those habits. And one of the things he speaks to is the 1% rule. If you get 1% better every day, 1% better every week, by the end of the year, you have made a huge shift than if you did nothing. So back to Alucci's comment about um, procrastinating and a high impact, high effort, you know, and end up doing it not last minute. I, um, with my uh, ADHD, I'm really good with <laughs> with procrastinating and, and not spending the time. So I have to create milestones. I have to create incentives. So I'll set up meetings with folks on a regular basis so that I have accountability to make sure that things are done each week in order to avoid that procrastination tendency that I have. So really thinking through how do I organize and protect my time so that I can spend the time I need in order to make the moves. And even if it's just an hour a day, an hour a week, an hour a month, it adds up. It adds up quicker than we would think because you start building momentum and success breeds success. So this is some, these are some of the things you can think about shifting and really prioritizing. 
Um, because I, you know, a lot of times we think of this, you know, scarcity mindset with time and, you know, we all have the same amount of time in a day. Often you see the most successful folks are very protective of how they spend their time. They do not, you know, waste time with things that don't necessarily help them move forward. They don't spend time in relationships that don't really matter to them. They are very quick to get through and delegate or not even address things that don't don't matter. So they spend more of their time on the right end, right hand side, the high impact, low effort, the high impact, high effort. And that's our goal is to shift as much of our energy on our daily activities into those two buckets. Doesn't mean we can't do everything else. We absolutely can, but maybe we don't spend as much time doing everything else. And because they are less impact, we may not see as much of the loss. I know there were um, some reports uh, that some folks were writing, one of my colleagues, um, and they just stopped writing the report. Like they stopped sending out these reports and realized no one was reading them. <laughs> so they took a low impact item that was taking time off of their schedule um, and realized, you know, it's not something they needed to do and they had to find another way to provide updates. So they set up a 15 minute huddle every week. So instead of spending hours doing a report, I could spend 15 minutes doing a huddle, have some quick notes, summarizing things and keep it flowing. So thinking about creative ways, what is the objective of this, right? The objective isn't a report. The objective was to communicate where we were in the project. So what else, what are there other ways that are more time efficient that will help us do that so that we can actually get things done and spend time doing things we actually enjoy? No one wants to be stuck in a loop of things that don't help. <laughs> it's very frustrating. It's a, it's, a, it's a drag, right? So we want to make sure we can do the things that help. So now that we've identified where we're going to spend our time, right? We're going to spend our time in the blue, the high impact, high effort items. Now we need to have a plan. We need to actually create the space and time to be able to implement it. And one of my favorite change models is managing complex change. There are many models out there. This is one of many that um, you can use, um, several different resources out there. This is one of my favorites because it's more people focused. And I can use this as a diagnostic tool. My brain, I'm an engineer by training, and my brain thinks in rows and columns. <laughs> I like to think of diagnosing things. <laughs> and so this visual really, really helps. So let's walk through it. This top row of this, uh, this visual includes all of the elements to create a complex change. You need five elements, and you need them pretty much in this order. The first is the vision. What is the vision we have to create? What is it that we're creating here? Secondly, what skills do my team, what skills do I need in order to implement and sustain this change? Are there trainings that I need to have? Are there some other practice areas that I have? What skills do I need? Incentives. Why? Why am I doing this? <laughs> What's the point? And incentives don't always mean money. What is it in it for me? What, what am I going to gain? What am I going to have uh, as an improvement? Why am I bothering? Resources. What are the time, money, tools, equipment that are needed? We talked about missing resources in, uh, in the earlier part of the conversation. Yeah, what are the resources that we need? How do we think through that? And then how do we put all of them together into an action plan? If all five exist, we have change. If all five are there in clear order, clear uh, communication, we have change. We have the ability to affect change. If any one of them is missing, we have something else. So for example, if we have missing incentives here in the middle, we have resistance. Now, a friend of mine likes to say all models are wrong. <laughs> Some are more wrong than others. So this is not meant to be a be all end all complete model, but it's a great place to start, right? I'm starting to see, oh, I'm getting resistance. Maybe I need to understand what are the person's motivations? What incentives are not in place for them to actually make this change? 
or what are the incentives for them to not do it, <laughs> right? Really being clear about what is actually in the way and what's happening. If we see confusion, we're missing a vision. We don't have clarity about where we're going and why we're going there. What does it look like, feel like? How does it work? How is it sustained? And often we don't really think that through. If we're making, you know, we talked earlier about the enterprise transition of a finance system. You know, what are what is the vision of what we'll be able to do with this new finance system that we couldn't do with the old one? What are the reasons why we had to make this transition? And if we have that clear vision, we know what this is going to look like. We know how our job is going to be different. It's easier to embrace the change. Any thoughts or questions on this model? This is actually my favorite model. Yeah, yeah Kim, thanks. I, lo I love it too. It's my favorite. I literally have this on my wall in the office. I just go back to it every once in a while. It's helpful for my personal work as well as professional work in, in identifying like what's in the way. What is the chance? What is it? I'm framing this. Yeah. <laughs> so really thinking about like what is happening here, right? And again, it depersonalizes it. Um, so what incentives would you give if you're not financial? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so there are folks who are about money that could be, um, easier ways to do the work. So for example, if I'm working with a team, let's say of, of drivers, they may be able to get, um, more, uh, if they're paid by the, by the drive, if I have a system that's more organized and more efficient, maybe they are able to get, um, more work done and get better pay. I don't know exactly. Um, the other could be just quality of life. Sometimes the incentive is, oh my goodness, you won't spend as much frustrated time working on this component. You can really spend less of your time here and more of your time doing the things you love. You'd have to really get into like, what is the actual change that's happening and what are some of the incentives? It's really important too, to really get into these incentives because sometimes it's a disincentive. For example, we could be implementing a system that's gonna be much more efficient for the organization, but that means less overtime for my team. So what, what are they going to deal with, right? They're gonna fight it because if they're used to overtime, that's a financial loss that they're going to take, right? So how do we navigate through that? What are some of the ways that that's gonna be better for them are we shifting our bonus structure? Are we giving them more opportunities for uh, improvement and upward mobility? Are there other benefits that they're going to gain because they're losing that? So really, it is very unique to the situations. We have to ask questions and really think through, like, what's in it for them? Why would they even embrace this change? And sometimes, you know, um, I've worked with teams where, yes, they were making more money, but in a very height market, we weren't laying anyone off. We were keeping our team members. We had that commitment to maintain the organization and we needed to do that because if we didn't, we would fail. And so really being clear and transparent as much as you can, again, you have to be conscious of the situation you're in and, and all the work that you're doing, but really, really thinking through like, what is it in it for them? Why would they want to make this change? And having team members who are boots on the ground and ask them, what do you see as the benefits of this? And now that you understand the vision, what are some of the things that you think this would help us do? And ask them. Often we try to assume and think we know all the answers and we can't, we can't. Especially if we're working in teams that have complex jobs and different, in, uh, different skill sets, having someone who is in the same role uh, help us navigate that is really important. I know when I've worked in a manufacturing environment and healthcare environments, those, when I saw resistance, I was so excited. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but I was so excited because when someone was resistant or they were frustrated, there was something I was missing in my planning. And there's usually some person <laughs> who is going to be the champion of that resistance. And if you can talk through the challenges with them, they can become your greatest supporters. They can become the folks who are helping you bring others on board once they've been heard. Because most times I would say, 
I wouldn't say all the time, but most times folks are coming to work to do a good job. Most people are there to do the best job they can with it. There are some who come in and they're not so motivated, right? But most folks, so if they are showing resistance or frustration or any of these feelings, that's not good for them. It's not good for us. So ask, support, have that conversation, and you will get so much more buy-in. So when I come with my next change, they know, they can trust that I'm going to listen. They're going to trust that I'm going to partner with them in implementing that change and that we can do this together. It's not me doing it to them anymore because there are teams that do that. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where someone comes in and they tell everybody what to do, they change everything up and then they leave and it's a mess. And people have had enough of those experiences where they're hesitant and you need to build up that trust. And sometimes it's been us who's done that. I've done that and I'm like, oh, that didn't go well. I need to, to make some amends and fix that so that we can actually move into the place where we are creating the change together. And that's where that leadership comes in. Like I am not making the change, we are making the change. I am not doing all the work, we are doing the work. And we can be ambassadors for navigating what's next. So this next slide just gives us more detail for each step. What are the definitions? What are some of the questions we can ask in order to have clarity around each of those uh, elements. And then some key questions. So key questions, what additional information would be helpful? Again, all models are wrong. Some are more wrong than others. There are pieces that are, I might miss if I just focus on these questions. What else am I missing? And this could also be a question you ask of your team and other key stakeholders in the organization. And then lastly, what potential challenges or mitigations, what other factors could be influencing our ability to be successful and how could we minimize our impact? In project management, uh, we have a tool called failure modes and effects analysis. We have other tools to really think through, like what are the risks to this project? What are the risks to this work? What are some of the outside forces? It seems like every day we get a new outside force, <laughs> whether it's uh, the pandemic, or it's some other major shift in demographics or the AI components of things. We're constantly bombarded with new things. What else is coming down the pipeline that might affect our ability to be successful in this work? Where does this project fit within the other projects in our organization? How do we make sure we have the resources, time and attention to be successful here while we are doing the other items? And so really thinking through what are some of those other potential challenges and mitigations and using your normal project management skill set, right? Really thinking about resource allocation, et cetera. So this just walks us through like those details. Okay. So question, action changes things. We can make this into a really nice conversation we've had over the last 45 minutes <laughs> of really neat tools, of things we talked about, some ideas, but action changes things. So what's one thing you're going to put into practice based on our conversation today? What are you going to try? What are you going to look into? What are you going to do to be a more effective change leader? You folks are typing. Awesome, awesome. So just wait for those to pop up. Yeah, that's really our goal is to actually do something different. <laughs> Have manageable and achievable goals. Yes, yes. Focus on high priority. Yeah, so really think about doing things in smaller chunks and getting things done. If I have a list of 20 items, I can't do all 20 at once. Get something done and then you'll get the 20 things done over time. But if you try to focus on 20, you get nothing. So focus on two or three. Absolutely. Um, and then so, so awesome. And then making sure that... Um, thinking about folks who are resistant to change and trying to act on it, really understanding where are they, what is in the way. And instead of it being this person is being difficult, the situation is difficult. 
what is it we're missing in this situation? And again, the model helps point the, us to start the conversation, but really it's a, a two-way discussion and dialogue to make sure we get through that, absolutely. Um, yeah, using the projects, yeah, have to help us point to the right direction. Focus on high priority, yes, right? So list out your items and make sure that items that have high priority, high impact, have space. They don't have to consume us because we have the whirlwind. We have to do things every day. I have to respond to that email. I have to pick up the phone. I have to go get the kids. I have to eat. <laughs> you know, right? There's certain things you have to do. They're going to fill your time. But make sure that the things that matter most, you make time for them. You make time for them. Absolutely. Awesome. And then also I offer an introductory coaching session. If anyone wants to talk about this further, I love talking about this. I don't know if you can tell, but this is like my jam. Uh, but would love to have any conversations that would be helpful for you um, on, on the work that we do here on uh, Change Leadership. So some final thoughts before we get to Q&A. Our goal is to move from survival mentality, survival method um, into thriving. And what does that mean? When you're in survival mode, your brain and body and emotions are laser focused. There's like lots of fear and anxiety. You're thinking about things that haven't even happened or might not, probably won't happen. You're in like high uh, energy mode and your behavior is like problem solving. Get done, get done, get done. It's like a frenetic nature. We do not want to be in survival mode. Leaders cannot survive long term in survival mode. We need to be in thriving. When you're in the thriving mode, there were several mentions in the comments about being calm, that we have the ability to pause, to reflect, to consider broader perspectives. And while it looks like our energy might be high, it's not fear and anxiety and energy spikes. It's this continuous passion and energy and excitement over getting things done in our day. I wake up excited about what I get to do today instead of dreading. Sunday nights are actually cool. So many people, if you're ever on social media or even just general communications, right? Sunday nights is like a super anxiety, anxious time for folks living in survival mode. Oh no, I have to go to work tomorrow. My weekend is over, oh no. If you're in thrive mode, Sunday nights is just another night. I get to do some great things tomorrow, just like I get to do any day. Mondays are so different. And your behavior, instead of being fast and problem solving, you move into innovation and collaboration. And that is my hope for you, is that you can structure your day, you can create a space in your world to have more energy, passion, and excitement every day and really be excited to do the things that you have to do. So thank you so much for the pre for time to present. Thank you, Knowledge Chain. I know Sebjen, you have some slides as well that you want to speak to. Um, so I will uh, transition to you. Thank you, Liz. That was a great presentation. Um, just before we head over to the Q&A, um, I would briefly like to talk to you about our courses. So the following um, are our courses that we have. The most appropriate to today's webinar will be change management. Um, so that would be the APMG change management. Um, other courses that could potentially be relevant are PRINCE2. Uh, and Prince2 Agile, perhaps. We also do have um, introductory product management courses. So that would be the beginners courses as well. Um, so if you are interested in any of our courses, you can email me or you can write your name here and I will email you. I'm just going to quickly write my email here. If you uh, are interested, you can always email me. If you have any other questions, you can also email me as well. Um, now, does everyone, does anyone have any questions? Let's just wait for a few minutes. If people have any questions, they can just jot them down in the group. While we wait for people to um, think of questions. There's a very short feedback form that I would like you guys to quickly fill out if that's okay.
Thank you, Natalie. I'm glad you found it useful. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions? I see some folks are typing. So, oh, yes, my pleasure. Thank you all very much for the feedback. And hopefully you can use some of these tools, like really think about in integrating these into your daily work, little by little, little by little. And you're, you'll be amazed at how quickly you build momentum and shift. Yeah. Also on a side note, um, yes, has been recorded. Yes, I was just about to say that, Tony. So this um, webinar is recorded and uh, once it's edited and uploaded on YouTube, I will make sure that everyone has access to it. I will send everyone the links. Excellent. You will also have access to the PDF version of the slides. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for joining. Good to see you. And it was great to meet everyone else who joined. Your great questions and feedback and thoughts, um, spending time and being fully engaged to make this uh, effort, you know, is a testament to your leadership. Like leaders continue to refine their skills and really care. And you're definitely showing that attention. Uh, and your um, your teammates are really lucky to have all of you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, yeah, thanks, Tony. Yeah. That's one I've used for many, many years. It's been huge, huge uh, shift in my mindset. So I'm grateful to share with everyone. Hopefully it makes as much of an impact for you as it does to me. Yes, thank you all. people are typing so let's just wait for them to type and then I don't think anyone would have any other questions. That's my pleasure John, pleasure. Awesome. I think we can slowly end the webinar. So thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate it. I hope you all learned something. We did get positive feedback, so I'm glad. And thank you, Lou, so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so thank you everyone. Thanks for joining. Take care. Thanks. Bye everyone.